So again, this is going to be 6,000 volts with a 100 microsecond full width half height. So it looks like we made some improvement. Unfortunately, not good enough. Hello again and welcome. You can see I have a brand new Cassuntest ZT102. This will be the third meter like this that I've purchased. These cost somewhere between $15 and $20 out on Amazon. Today we're going to be looking at modifying this meter to make it more robust. And again, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you would ever modify a handheld meter like this. Again, your chances of making it very unsafe, I would say, are pretty good. So don't do this at home. These videos are purely for educational purposes. This is the first ZT-102 that I had purchased. You can see I've stripped some of the parts off of this, but you can see some of the damage up in this area here. It's also lost some of the traces. This was the second one that I purchased that I had attempted to modify to make it more robust. Again, I've stripped a couple of the components off of this. You can see that I chopped up the circuit board quite a bit. This meter had failed at 3000 volts peak. This meter, it survived the 3000 volt peak, but then I took it up to about 6000 volts and this meter failed as well. So you can see what's happened is we broke over the PTC. Of course, that put a huge current spike through our high-speed clamp, which damaged the IC, and this is basically now a dead short. So what we're going to be doing with this new meter is making another attempt at modifying the meter similar to this one because I had already made all the new connectors for this and I also had modified the case. Uh, it'll be a fairly simple job to actually go ahead and modify this meter. So one of the things that I noticed is, first of all, the serial number on this meter is older than the last one that I had purchased. It's newer than the first one that I had purchased. But it has a feature that the first two that I purchased did not have. That's if I go to the volts mode, you can see I can select DC, AC, and then it goes to Hertz, and then Duty Cycle. These first two meters did not have that feature. When I purchased the AN8008, this meter actually had that feature on it. And you can see it's marked right up on the switch. It's got percent and Hertz. This meter is not marked like that. So it's kind of odd that they had added that feature. Again, with it being a later serial number than the last one, it makes no sense to me. I don't know if they recycle through the same serial numbers or... Yeah, I really have no idea. <laughs> but there's obviously a difference. I also, I've had this meter apart and I've fully functional tested it. And I noticed some other changes. One, the ball detent for this meter is back to the silver springs. So the very first one I bought... This used silver colored springs and then they went to a copper style. The rotary switch on this one was very tight. Uh, so I changed out the springs off the old meter and placed them in the new one. This meter is back to a very nice feeling on the switch. And when I took it apart, it has the silver springs in it. Another thing that I noticed is the crystal that they had used for these different circuit boards. Every one of these boards is unique. You'd think they'd just buy the same device, but Apparently not. So let's have a look at why this meter fails off of my transient generators where some of these other ones that I look at don't. I've got two meters here. This is the Fluke 107. This was provided by 5KY. And I also have Dave's rebranded Bryman BM235. These meters both have survived some very high transients. And they have something in common. And you can see it right here. You can see this large series resistor, and we can see the same thing with the Fluke 107. Very large resistor, and look at the size of the PTC that they're using. And then we can see the two mobs sitting over here. On these meters, it's not built like that. So if we look at this Kassun test, basically the input comes in through a switch, and then they have this PTC, and they have a couple of transistors back to back. And then these act as your high-speed clamp. And there's a small series resistor. And this goes back to the IC. I think this is 100 ohms. This is like 1.3K. And then the switch is your selector switch on the front. So this high-speed clamp, this is these two transistors that are located right here. You can see the PTC would have been located here originally. I've stripped it. 
and I moved it over to this location here. If we look at our two transistors back to back, this is going to clamp somewhere below 10 volts usually. Essentially what that's going to do is put all the stress across the switch here and across this resistor. Normally it's not going to be much of a problem, but there's another leg of this and it goes across another switch contact and sitting across this is a TVS to ground. Again, I kind of stripped some of those parts, but essentially that's going through this fuse up through this trace here into this TVS here and that's going through these two contacts right here. These contacts you can see have actually been destroyed of course the fuse gets destroyed and you can see where it's actually arced across the two fuse holders so we do have a fuse located here but again this basically shorts out this switch shorts out this TVS I think was like 10 volts as well so now all that current is felt across the switch contact and this basically vaporizes the nice thing about this is because it is essentially a spark gap what ends up happening is this ends up saving this part of the meter for a while until you push enough current through it and then bad things can happen and you can see essentially we've melted this trace here is completely gone you can see some of the damage to these traces up in here so the right thing to really do would be to put that protection up on the front end to save the switch all these meters are fairly similar they basically have the input it goes through a resistor and then through the PTC and then they'll have some MOVs typically there'll be at least two of these in series to get their voltage up this will go back to the common point and we have our function switch out here and again our two back-to-back -back transistors and our resistor and then back to the IC chip so now our clamping voltage over here is somewhere around 2000 volts so this again is our PTC located here and this is typically like a 1k ohm resistor so between the two you'll see roughly 2000 ohms or so so again we've really limited the voltage that's seen across this switch contact so what ends up happening now is we still clamp this at somewhere around 10 volts but because we have this 2000 ohms if we look at our 6kV and we divide that by our 2k ohms you know we're somewhere in the 3 amp range that's actually being felt across this in our switch contacts so a design like this you can see how this is going to be a lot more robust a design like this what can happen is the PTC can arc over and all that current then will feed through this if you figure you know 6 kV across essentially a zero ohm resistor it's essentially infinite current now our generator has a two ohm source impedance so we're limited to about 3000 amps that that's going to put out again that's going to be a very short duration but in a system like this even if the PTC were to short we still have that 1k ohm series resistance to limit the current felt by this transistor bridge so if we look at the two resistors again you can see both the Bryman and the Fluke are using a 1k ohm series resistor that's fairly common I've seen different values used I've also seen different values for the PTC's I've seen them range all the way between about 500 ohms and about 1.5 K ohms so if we look at the last meter that I modified I tried to basically rearrange the components so we had the PTC on the front end and then that goes to the switch and then on the back side we've got our clamps and then I've added a MOV and this is just a single MOV and then you had your series resistor out here so this worked pretty good it got us over the 3000 volt range and it limits the amount of voltage across these switch contacts when I did this I'd also move the current input so instead of being shared with the voltage input it all runs through this separate current input so because of that isolation I was able to move the TVS from this side of the board over to this side next to the fuse so that eliminates the use of this switch over here which was part of our first breakdown path so this survived 3000 volts but again what had happened is this PTC arced over and essentially it put the full force of the generator right into our 10 volt clamp and so now we're looking at basically 3000 amps going across this instead of about five or so and it blew up these transistors and of course then once those opened up 
we only had the 100 ohm resistor feeding into the IC chip and so that's a pretty big transient to feed into that and that wiped out the IC. What we're going to be doing now is essentially adding a series resistor in front of this and we're also going to be using some different PTCs than what was actually included with the Kassan test. So I had made this circuit board, you've probably seen this before if you watch my videos. This is essentially my multimeter front end simulator board. These are some of the components that I've had on this board over time. This black mob is the one that I ended up using for the UT61E when I had modified it. See I've had some very small PTCs and I've also had some quite large ones that I've looked at. Uh, different series resistors. This one is made by Ohmite. This is a OY series part. Again this is a 1K ohm. Uh, the OYs, I think this is rated for 2 watts. The resistor choice is quite critical. This is a resistor made by Stackpole. Uh, this is the ASRM series device. This is a 2 watt metal film. These are uh, flame retardant, pulse withstanding, safety type. The small PTC that I'm looking at here, this is made by Epcos. Again, this is a 1.3K ohm device. And you can see where I've blown the outside of this as well. So I don't collect old antique meters. I know there's a few of you out there that probably do. And if you look at this resistor on some of those, what you're going to find is this was originally a carbon comp resistor. And of course those have been obsoleted over time and manufacturers have had to find other replacement devices. This resistor was made by Ohmite. It's the Little Devil series. This is also made by Ohmite. This is the Little Demon and these are both carbon comp resistors. Both of these are of course obsolete. The last several times I've used this board, I had this device here. This is again made by Ohmite and this is the OY series parts. These are fairly robust. You can see this is the data sheet for it. That's ceramic composition 10% tolerance. The OXOY series of fixed ceramic resistors are ideal for circuitry associated with surges, high peak power, or high energy. They offer enhanced performance and high voltage power supplies, RC snubbers, and inrush limiters. The OXOY resistors can often replace the carbon composition resistors, which can be difficult to source. So the OX parts are the 1 watt, and then the OY are the 2 watt components. And you can see they go between 3.3 ohms and up to 1 meg for the 2 watt and 100k for the 1 watt series parts. What's good about these is we can see the maximum joule rating for the 1 watt part is 50 and 80 for the 2 watt part. You can also see down here this is the pulse tolerance, 100 pulses. This is at uh, 1240 volts with a 52 microfarad capacitor at 40 joules for 35 seconds and the 2 watt part is tested at 1640 volts again with a 52 microfarad capacitor and that's 37 joules for 35 seconds. This is our max pulse voltage and it's 14 kV for the OX and 20 kV for the OY. The maximum working voltage for these devices are 300 volts for the OX and 400 volts for the OY. Again, these resistors would be placed in series with a PTC, so they don't necessarily have to handle this entire voltage. This is the data sheet for the stack pole parts. So again, we can see excellent anti-surge characteristics, good alternative to carbon composition resistors. So if you calculate the amount of energy that these can handle compared to what the Ohmite part, it's not even close. So I wouldn't be too surprised when you're looking at these higher quality meters that the resistors that you're seeing inside of these aren't made by Ohmite. If we look at the PTC, uh, this is just a typical part. This was made by GE. And you can see it's just designed for over current, over voltage. The ability to withstand a direct connection up to 1000 volts RMS supply. You can see these are made from a high performance barium tetronate ceramic can see the standard resistance at 25 degrees is 1100 ohms and the residual current at 25 degrees is less than 2 milliamps. You can see the problem that you run into these if we look at the trip times for these. If we put 2.5 amps through this uh, YS4019 it takes about 100 milliseconds to clear and the problem with this is that, of course, the full width half height that I'm testing to is 100 microseconds. 
you would think that these PTCs, that the thermal response is going to be so slow that essentially all you have is another series resistance. So I'd ran some tests where I took these two high voltage probes and I had one probe looking across the entire network and I had the other one looking just across the PTC with both of these at roughly 1k ohm you'd end up with a 50% divider at say 2000 volts but as I went to you know 6000 volts and up the PTC actually did start to respond and you would see more voltage drop across the PTC than you would the resistor. So it puts more strain across the PTC which leads me to believe that you would want something larger like maybe this one here and that's what you're seeing on the Fluke 107. Again quite a large PTC and again I'm thinking what's happening there is because the thermal response of this is so slow Basically, you end up with this 50% divider between these two parts. So I've included some screenshots I've taken with the LaCroix. And you can see where I started out testing these at 2 kV and then I went to 4 kV. And you can see the roughly 50% divider. And then what I've done is I've increased the voltage all the way up to about 6,000 volts. And you can start to see this PTC open up. On the right it's one of the PTCs from EPCOS. Again, this is a 1.3k ohm device. On the left, this is one of the Ohmite Little Devils. And again, this is a 1k ohm device. So what I've done is I've turned the generator all the way up. And I'm going to apply five transients to this network. And let's just see if this thing will survive. Alright, so no problems at all. This is looking at the Epicos PTC and stack pole parts that had previously damaged. Again, this is the same transient that I just previously ran. So why test right across this when you have this series mob? Again, it's because we have this clamp on the back side, and when I test the meters, I run them through all the different functions. So one of them would obviously be the resistance dial check mode. So this switch would be closed and this clamp would be engaged. So essentially, we are supplying the transient across these two components. And that's what you see has happened with the last meter that I had modified. One PTC was damaged, this other one is still intact. And the reason this one survived is this one is strictly in series with the MOV. There is no high-speed clamp for this other leg. The reason that we don't need the high-speed clamp is because the other leg of this is running up to our 10 mega ohm series resistor. So the input impedance on that is actually quite high and those inputs can survive with just the MOV by itself. And you see that with a lot of meters like this 107. Again, there's just the single resistor coming off of this single PTC and that's basically it the two mobs in series some of the other meters like this Brahman BM235 again you see the two resistors coming back and then there's two PTCs two mobs and then a single mob that goes back to our common point so this is a little more complex as far as the front end some of the meters I'll see three different legs coming off of this like the SEM meter that I tested Again, it just depends. Each manufacturer is going to design their meter a little differently depending on what functions they have. Of course, this Bryman BM235 has quite a few more features than the 107. In this meter, of course, we still have the temperature, the resistance, the diode check, and the capacitance mode. So quite a few features on this even compared to this 107. And of course, again, where I showed that this meter is pretty much the same size as the Fluke 101, which is a little smaller, again, than the 107 is. And that's namely because the 101 doesn't have the current input, so they don't need this additional fuse in here. Of course, these meters come with these very tiny fuses, which, again, these can actually arc right across. So before we get started modifying the ZT-102 for the second time, there's a couple of things I'd like to go over. One of them... I've modified this box again. You can see I've changed this over to include an AC plus DC. So this is again just a rectified signal. This outputs basically 60 volts DC, 70 volts AC, and 90 volts DC plus AC. 
And the reason I've added that feature is because of meters like this that have had troubles with the rectified signal. So it just gives me a quick way to uh, check some of these meters out. Another thing I did is you may have noticed in quite a few of the videos that this 5 volt reference was actually like 4.96 or something. It was quite a bit low. It definitely wasn't 5 volts. So I've made corrections to this box to fix this. So I've trimmed this against my HP bench meter. And so this is now again quite accurate. The other thing I've done is I've added a white LED. I don't know why people want to test with this white LED. I assume it's because of the voltage drop. So this one requires about 2.5 volts to light up. Typically I've been running just three uh, silicon diodes in series to check it. So you can see the LED sitting here in the center. But those are the only changes that I made to the box. Again, this is our 34401A. And I haven't given this any warm up time. And this is the output again off of the reference. And again, this meter will drift slightly as we let it warm up. This is looking off of our fluke reference standard. And again, this is a 10 volt signal. So again, you can pretty much trust the accuracy of this box. So one of the common concerns I see about some of these meters is because they're not built here in the United States, you know, what happens if they fall out of calibration and they need to be aligned? Who do you take them to? You know, I'm not sure if there's any places here in the United States that'll do an alignment on one of these. I don't think it would be too difficult to work with Bryman and actually have them work with a calibration house to set them up to actually go through an alignment. But I purchased this meter a little over two years ago. Uh, let's just have a look at how this is with the 5 volt reference coming off of our box here. So we can see here, even after two years, this meter is still pretty much dead on. And I would kind of expect it. I mean, again, this is a higher class meter. Again, as far as buying a brand new meter, this has by far been my favorite out of all the ones that I've looked at. It has all the features that I commonly use, plus some additional ones for the $230 that they sell these for. This has been a pretty good deal. So again, this meter had a problem where I ran it with this transient generator. Again, this can output a fully rectified 220 volt signal. And what would happen with the original versions of this meter, you could put it into the AC volt mode and it would not read correctly. It would read the DC output correctly, but when you would switch it to AC, it would read a low voltage. And that was because the auto range on it. So let's just try it with this new meter. So let's just start with our box set for five volts. And we can see it's fairly accurate. 4.999, it's within one count. No problem there. So now I'm going to select our high voltage DC output. And again, this should be roughly 60 volts. No problems there. And let's go to AC. And look at this, 4.3 volts roughly. And again, this is outputting roughly 70 volts right now. The output of this is actually at roughly 3 kilohertz. So if I turn this on, you can see in the hertz mode, it isn't able to read this. So you can see in our dedicated frequency input, it's reading roughly 3.017 kilohertz. And let's try duty cycle, so 50.4%. What you're going to find is the same problem over here. So this would be an AC coupled input. That's at 60 hertz. So now what I'm going to do is bias this up. So again, this is switching between 0 and 5 volts now. So it should read uh, 2.5 volts AC roughly. Yeah, that's no problem. So the meter in the AC volts mode needs the zero cross in order to actually read the frequency. But again, I'm actually surprised this meter even has this feature. The first two that I purchased didn't have this at all. And again, the meter isn't even marked to have that feature. It's kind of strange. So let's have a look at our diode check. And again, I have this uh, white LED in here. And you can see it has no trouble at all lighting that up. So I'm not sure, again, what the big deal about that is. This is a uh, 2.6 volts, roughly. A lot of the meters that I look at, if you look at the spreadsheet, are over 3 volts of drive. I think it's going to be fairly rare that I'd find a meter that wouldn't be able to light this up. So when I posted the video about modifying the second meter, somebody had posted about how you can actually go through and align it. And I was aware that if I jump JP2 and then turn the meter on, it would show Cal. I didn't know exactly how to go about aligning the meter. 
So after I had modified this meter, adding the two mobs on the input, this meter shows about 100 picofarads of offset. And again, that's just because of the mobs. So I was curious if I could go through and realign this meter to actually get rid of that 100 picofarad offset. So I played around with this meter quite a bit, trying to adjust for that, and unfortunately, it doesn't appear that I'm able to do that. I can definitely go in and screw it up. So I found, for example, if I used a 500 nanofarad capacitor and I went through and I hit the calibration, that capacitor would be dead on. And then if I set it up for 50 nanofarads and I could cal that out and that would be dead on, but that would screw up the 500 nanofarad cal. So it appears to be fairly limited is the number of breakpoints that they allow. But it's kind of nice. It doesn't appear that you actually have to break the case open other than to apply the jumper so that's a lot better at least than hooking the prom programmer up to our prom, downloading the contents, tweaking the values manually, reprogramming the device and ping-ponging back and forth like that. Just use the jumper and use the menus and it'll rewrite the cal values out to this without any problem. So when I was a child I was one of these kids that would take their toys apart and I would attempt to reassemble them and it seems like often I'd have spare parts. And that's what you see here. These are the spare parts off of my ZT-102 that I've just modified. So this is the new circuit board. And again, I've scavenged some of the parts off of the first one that I modified. And the reason I did that is because I spent some time, you know, making these new connectors for it. And I thought, well, we'll just reuse them again. So you can see I also reused the mobs that I had installed. I don't believe I damaged those at all again. Those mobs are rated for quite a bit more energy than what the transient generator is able to supply anyway. So looking at the front side of the two meters, you can see they basically look the same. But from the back side, it's quite a bit different. The first thing you'll notice is this large fuse. This is one of the ones that David supplied. This is a ASTM. This comes from one of the kits that he sells. So this is a 1000 volt, 400 milliamp rated fuse. And if we look, you can see I've removed the shunt. Originally, this had the 0.01 ohm shunt across here, and because I'm not using the amp scale, this has actually been replaced. And this is a 1% 1, 1 ohm resistor. And then I've changed the value of this to give me the microamp mode. I haven't taken the time to figure out what the mode selects are on this and if they've been bonded out to where it actually display in microamps. Depending on how this testing goes, I may invest a little bit more time. But again, you can see I've moved the TBS over to the front side of the fuse. This is the same that I'd done with this one. So the fuse holder was right here originally, and this is the TBS where I've moved it over. Here you can see I've tweaked some of the values to bring this in. Again, I just used the 1 ohm on this one and called it a day. The other thing I've done, as you can see, now we have this large resistor. And that, hopefully, is what's going to get us over that 6 kV hump. The other thing I've done, as you can see, the PTCs now are quite large. And again, that's what happened with the old meter, is it was supplied with these much smaller PTCs. You can see the difference between these two. It's quite significant. So again, uh, this bigger PTC should be able to withstand a much higher voltage before it breaks down like these smaller ones that we had originally used. You'll notice that I only have the one resistor. And again, that's because this other leg is what's feeding to our 10 mega ohm input up here. So what I'm hoping here is that this PTC is actually going to handle this before it breaks down. And that's because, again, we have basically another 800 volts of headroom on top of what this one would have. And that's because this mob is the thing that's going to limit it. There isn't a second high-speed clamp that will bring this thing down to, you know, 10 volts or basically short this PTC out. So, again, that's what had happened before is this one PTC had survived, and that was the one driving the high impedance line. Again, you can see I've added some slots right here and there's another one coming across under this PTC and there's another one underneath this PTC here you can see it on the back side right here and right here and there's another one right here there's also uh, slits along the fuse run here you also notice that I've cut the circuit board in this area 
and so this is now isolated from this really what I should do is just drill this out and get rid of all this copper altogether you know that would be the ideal situation but I think for now this will be good enough just to test this thing out and see if it still works functionally so one of the other things I had done that's different between the two meters originally I had jumped out the original PTC and you can see now I have a small 100 ohm series resistor again what I'm trying to do is basically prevent this chip from getting damaged this time so even if everything else goes wrong I have some limiting resistor up here to limit the current back into our clamp the other thing I've done is I've added a jumper up here for the calibration and that is going to allow me to try to realign the meter for capacitance after adding the additional capacitors up here and the last difference is I had used this high density plastic to kind of isolate this jumper here from the rest of the circuit board so on this board you can maybe see in the camera up here I'm using a polyamide or a Kapton tape and that's actually doing the isolation and things are routed slightly different so our 10 meg input is going over to the clamp over here it used to be over here but because I could only locate the resistor on the edge here this becomes the clamp for our current input so as far as calibrating the meter we would install our jumper on the back side we turn the meter off and then we turn it on you see it will come up with cal you could actually run through the menus in any mode of the meter but the only way to actually calibrate it is to have it in the ohms mode and that's basically because you need this current source enabled to calibrate the resistance so again you just turn it off place it into ohms mode and then we can select the mode that we want to cal and that's done through this function select switch as you can see it's in capacitance mode here there's our degrees DC millivolts and resistance and then back to capacitance so once you have the function that you're going to align so in this case capacitance the way this works is you place your standard on the front end and you can select the blue button and that will decrement the value and we can press the range switch on the back and that will increment the value once you get that set you press the orange button and that seems to store it so again the problem that I'm seeing with this particular meter is if I put in a 500 picofarad capacitor and I try to align to that it won't allow me to so I can never seem to get rid of this residual capacitance with it okay so the meter is back together and we can see now when I select the manual range in the back it goes into manual so now if we attach it to our 5 volt reference you can see it reads 4.999 volts and this should be 0 volts and this should be 2.5 volts let's try it in AC mode should be roughly 2.5 and this should be 2.5 as well in frequency this should be 60 Hertz and this should be 0 Hertz because we're not going through the zero cross if we go over to the frequency input here this should read 60 Hertz this should be 30 15 and 120 so that all seems correct let's try duty cycle and 50% that is correct let's try it in the millivolt range again this should be roughly about 118 millivolts that is correct so no problems there so let's try it in the resistance mode so this is with a short this is with 0.5 ohms this is with a 1 ohm, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 1k ohm, 10k ohms, 100k ohms, 1 mega ohm, 10 mega ohms. This is with a 2% 40 mega ohm resistor. Continuity test seems fine. Diode check that's with a short and again here's a single diode two diodes but again we can see our white LED emitting and it's roughly 2.6 volts so again in capacitance mode because we're using the same mobs we have about 100 picofarads of offset and again I have not figured out a good way to null this out so this is 150 picofarads 
So about 248. This is with one nanofarad. Again, 1.1 because of the 100 picofarad offset. This is a 0.1 microfarad. It's with our 10 microfarads. And this is our 100 microfarad capacitor. And in temperature mode, again, this should be roughly 500 degrees Celsius. Looks fairly close. Again, this should be a little over a thousand and roughly room temperature, so that appears to be correct. And in the current mode, again, this should be roughly 100 microamps. So it, you can see it's 0 0.09. And so you can see I have our transient generator out, and I'm just going to enable our AC output. So again, it's 240 volts roughly, and this is a fully rectified 60 hertz waveform. So what I'm going to do is run this through all the different modes of the meter. So before we do that again, if I select AC, you can see it reads 1.2 volts. But again, because we have the manual range select button, we can go through and select this to a different range. And you can see 118.6. And again, if I go back to DC, there's our 240. And again, this will not be able to read the frequency, but this would normally be 120 hertz. So we'll go ahead and run this through all these modes, and let's see if we damage the meter at all. So let's see, this is millivolts, this is resistance, uh, frequency, and again, because the fuses are not shared here, we can go over to temperature. And I'll go ahead and functional test the meter, and let's see if we caused any problems with it. Okay, so the meter survived that test just fine. You can see I have our high voltage transient generator out. So I'm going to be applying a DC output off of this generator. I think the last meter I had modified this uh, clamped at somewhere around 800 volt. I would expect it's going to be the same with the same mob. So yeah, about 812. That's the upper end of it. You can see here on the display, it's at uh, 820 volts, so it's current limiting this power supply. I don't have a higher current high voltage power supply than this at the moment. So the next thing we'll do is use the transient generator to output our electrostatic discharge pulse. The output waveform of this basically follows the IEC standard. Again, I used to do quite a bit of testing with the grill starter, but I showed the waveforms off of that, and it's quite a bit less than what the IEC standard calls for. So this generator does a much better job simulating those standards. So again, I'll be applying five transients to each mode of the meter, and then we'll perform a functional test on it. And again, we'll do both positive and negative polarities. Alright, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter and we'll see if it survived this. Okay, so the meter passed the ESD testing just fine. You can see we have our high voltage probe and the Fluke 97 connected right now. And we're going to be starting off with 3000 volts peak. Again, this will be a 100 microsecond full width half height with a 2 ohm source impedance. And we'll be applying 5 transients, both positive and negative, to each mode of the meter. So I think rather than running it right up to 6kV after this, assuming this passes, what I'll do is probably do increments of 1000 volts and maybe give us a better idea where the meter actually fails at. Alright, that's it. Let's have a quick look. Doesn't look like we've blown anything on the input. You can see it's reading infinite resistance. It's usually a pretty good sign. Here's with my fingers, so that seems to be okay. So I've gone through a full functional test and the meter appears to be just fine. So the last time I ran this meter I had gone from 3000, the meter worked fine, and then I went straight to 6. 
And of course that's where the PTC broke down and we lost the meter. So what I'm going to do with this meter is run it in increments of a thousand volts. So I've got our generator set for 4 kV right now. So again this will be a 100 microsecond full width half height. Again with a 2 ohm source impedance and 5 transients each. Here we can see it on the scope. It's basically a thousand volts per division, four divisions up. Okay, that's it. Let's just do again a real quick check here. Let's see, temperature again, so this should be roughly 500 degrees Celsius and room temp and a little over a thousand degrees. And this will be in frequency, so this should be roughly 60 hertz. Looks fine. And 50% duty cycle. Let's try it in the volts mode. So this should be 5 volts. That looks fine. This should be 2.5. That looks fine. Let's try AC. That looks fine. Let's try the frequency in AC mode. 60 hertz. That looks good. And this will be the millivolt range. And this should be roughly 118. That looks fine. And resistance. This will be a 10 mega ohm resistor. That appears fine. And this is a 50 ohm resistor. So that looks fine. So I'll go ahead and fully functional test this. And then we'll see about setting up the next test. Alright, so the meter passed functional test just fine. I've reprogrammed our generator to put out 5,000 volts peak. Again, this will be a 100 microsecond full width half height with a 2 ohm source impedance. Again, we'll be applying positive and negative transients, 5 each, to each function of the meter. Let's have a look. This will be DC volts. And let's just start with 5 volts. That's correct. This will be 2.5. That's correct. Let's put in AC mode. That's correct. Let's just check the millivolts. This will be 118 millivolts. That's correct. Try the frequency. 60 Hertz, that's correct. Let's try temperature. So again, this should be a little over a thousand and basically room temperature. That seems correct. And let's try resistance. So this will be a 10 mega ohm. And that's correct. And this will be 50 ohms. That's correct. Let's just check the capacitance real quick. That seems right, you know, still about 100 picofarads. Let's just try one nanofarad. And this will be a 0.1 microfarad. Looks good. All right, let me go ahead and I'll finish functional testing it and then we'll reset up the generator. All right, so the meter passes functional just fine. I've changed our generator so this is now set for its maximum output voltage. So this is just shy of 6,000 volts. This is where this meter had actually failed at. Again, we'll be applying five transients in each mode of the meter. I don't know if this is going to survive or not. We'll find out. So again, just shy of 6,000 volts, 100 microsecond full with half height.
All right, that's the end of it. Just zoom out here a little bit. Let's just have a quick look. So this will be 5 volt. And this should be 2.5. In AC, this should be 2.5. And, and frequency, this should be 60 hertz. That's fine. Again, this should be 118. That's fine. And this should be 60 hertz here. That's fine. Let's try temperature. And this should be roughly room temp. And this should be a little over a thousand degrees. That's fine. And this will be resistance, so this will be a 10 mega ohm. That looks fine. This will be 50 ohms. That looks fine. Let's try capacitance. It's continuity. That's fine. Diode check. That's fine. And the capacitance looks fine. This will be a 0.1. Looks fine. So I'll go ahead and finish functional testing this. Alright, so the meter passes functional just fine. So we've exceeded what our first modified meter could handle. So you can see I have our original transient generator out. This is set up for 6,000 volts and this is a 50 microsecond full width half height. And it's also with a 2 ohm source impedance. You can see our little scope meter is set for 2,000 volts per division or 3 divisions up. So again, we'll be applying five transients, both positive and negative, with each mode of the meter, and then we'll do a functional test. All right, that's it. And let's just do a real quick check. This should be 5 volts. That looks fine. Let's just try the millivolts mode real quick. And this should be 118 millivolts. That seems fine. And frequency should be 60 hertz. That looks fine. Temperature should again be about 1057. And this should be roughly room temp. And then resistance, this is a 10 mega ohm. Looks fine. And this will be 50 ohms. Looks fine. Let's just try capacitance real quick. Again, about 70 picofarad. It's about what I've been seeing with the meter. So again, this will be 1 nanofarad, 0.1 microfarad. So the meter looks okay. I'll go ahead and finish functional testing it. All right, so the meter passes functional just fine. All right, so you can see I've changed our generator. This is 2,000 volts per division and four divisions up or 8,000 volts peak. Again, this is a 50 microsecond full width half height. Again, we'll be applying five transients each mode of the meter. Somebody had said when I tested this meter and it, it survived at 3,000 volts that they would have stopped the testing. And again, that's not really what this channel is about. I'll take these meters up typically to the point where they fail. Again, what kind of started this is somebody had mentioned just putting the mob across the input of this thing and seeing if that would improve the meter. You can see that it's actually taking quite a bit more to improve it. Alright, so again, five transients each mode. Well, it looks like we're breaking down. I'm not sure if we've actually damaged the meter or not, though. Looks like it's arcing right between the two inputs. Let's 
just have a quick look here. So again, this will be a 10 mega ohm resistor. That looks good. Let's try it with a 50. That seems fine. Continuity, that seems to work. Dial check looks to work. Uh, still roughly 70 picofarads. This will be a 0.1 microfarad. That looks good. So let's see, this will be 30 hertz. This should be 60 hertz. This will be 15 and 120. So the frequency seems to work. This should be 50% duty cycle. That seems fine. Again, this should be roughly 118 millivolts, and that looks fine. This should be roughly 5 volts. Looks good. This should be 2.5. That looks fine. And this should be 2.5 as well. That looks fine. And frequency should be 60 hertz. That looks good. 50% duty cycle. That seems fine. Let's try the temperature input. So again, this should be room temp. And this should be a little over a thousand. So that seems fine. So something's breaking down in the meter. I probably have a clearance issue. But it doesn't appear to have damaged the meter yet. So let's go ahead and take this thing apart. I suspect right here where I don't have this slit cut all the way through it looks like it's arcing between this pad here and this pad right here. Right, This will be the same transient roughly 8,000 volts. Let's just see if we can see this break down here. Yep, you can see it's definitely the top side of the board, and it's right where I haven't cut this all the way through. Here you can see I've opened the slit up just a little bit, and I've added this Teflon spacer. You can see I've also raised the height of the PTC, so that allows this Teflon spacer to actually go all the way up through the circuit board. I think the only problem now is because we don't have the series resistor with this PTC I'm not sure if this isn't going to be our next breakdown point point. and you can see there's not a whole lot of room in this meter to add a second resistor unfortunately we're cutting out the ground plane here if we try to lay one across this direction Oh, it looks like it holds. Alright, so I've reassembled our meter. Let's just continue with our testing. So again, this will be 8,000 volts. I'll just repeat the whole test. And let's see if this will break down again. Alright, let's just do a quick check. So again, this should be 5 volts. Should be 2.5. Should be 60 hertz. And 50% duty cycle. And 118 millivolts. Should be 60 hertz. Somewhere around room temp. And a little over a thousand. And this is with an open and a short. Let's just try a 10 meg. Looks good. Continuity test. That looks good. Dial check. Seems fine. And it looks like our residual capacitance is still the same as with a 0.1.
looks good all right I'll go ahead and finish functional testing it all right so the meter passes functional test just fine you can see I've changed our scope it's now 5,000 volts per division two divisions up or roughly 10,000 volts peak okay so this is going to be 10,000 volts with a 50 microsecond full width half height and a 2 ohm source impedance Oh, well, I'll bet you that's our PTC. Let's have a quick look. We'll make sure that everything's okay. So again, this will be 5 volts. Yep, that looks good. This should be 2.5 and 2.5 and 60 hertz and 50% and 118 millivolts. Yeah, so it doesn't look like we damaged anything. This will be our 10 mega ohm resistor. Yep. So I'm afraid what's happened now is that PTC that's directly connected between the input and the MOV is breaking down. So the only way that we're going to fix that is to add a second series resistor. So this is looking at the PTC that just came out of the meter. I had coated this with Corona dope and then I put a layer of heat shrink tubing over it and unfortunately that was not enough to prevent this from breaking down so I have one of these left and this is what I've done so this is our original resistor this is the one I've just added unfortunately there's just not enough room even if I laid the resistor across this way again I'd just be cutting into the ground plane unfortunately this meter just doesn't have enough room so I'll go ahead and reassemble this meter and we can get started testing 14 kV or bust obviously it's modified don't use it typically mark the meters that I modify just to make it clear if somebody got a hold of one of these don't use it alright so the generator is still set for 10,000 volts peak again this is a 50 microsecond full width half height there's the first pulse it looks good so far see the scope waveform here and this is uh, 5,000 volts per division two divisions up or 10 kV Okay, let's have a look at it. Right, this should be 5 volts. This should be 2.5 volts. This should be 2.5. And, and this should be 2.5. And, and that should be 60 hertz. 50% duty cycle. This is with a 10 mega ohm resistor. Let's see what it does with our 40 meg. Looks fine. Continuity looks fine. Dial check seems fine. Uh, the capacitance looks normal, about 70 picofarads. What we've been seeing should be 15 hertz, 120. That looks fine. Should be roughly 500 degrees C. That looks fine. So I'll go ahead and finish functional testing the meter, but it looks to be okay. All right, so it looks like our meter survived that test just fine. So I've changed our generator, as you can see we're at 5,000 volts per division 
and it's 50 microseconds per division so it's three divisions up or just a little bit over 15,000 volts with a full width half height of about 50 microseconds so this is going to be about 16,000 volts peak 50 microsecond full width half height Well, looks like it can't take it. Let's have a look. See if the meter still functions. Alright, so this will be 5 volts. So that seems to still work. Let's try it in AC volts. Should be 2.5. That seems fine. Let's try the millivolt input. Should be 118. That still works. Alright, this will be a 10 mega ohm resistor. So no damage there. Continuity seems fine. Diode check seems fine. Our capacitance still looks fine. Let's try temperature. Again this will be roughly 500 degrees Celsius. That looks fine. And this will be our frequency input. And again this should be 60 Hertz so that looks fine so it doesn't look like we've damaged the meter but I think we've basically hit our limit so I'm not going to do anything more with the meter again I think it's just too tight well, I'd like to take this time to welcome all you new followers glad to have you on board hope you enjoyed the video until the next meter later